specializes in helping leaders concerned about resistance to change. He serves as the CEO of the boutique consulting and training company, Disaster Avoidance Experts. Its solutions transform resistance to change into commitment by fusing narratives, nudges, and neuroscience. A best-selling author, he wrote, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters, The Blind Spots Between Us, How to Overcome Unconscious Cognitive Bias and Build Better Relationships, and, re re and Resilience, Adapt and Plan for the New Abnormal of the COVID-19 Coronavirus Pandemic. His cutting edge thought leadership was featured in over 550 articles and 450 interviews in prominent venues such as Today, Fast Company, CBS News, CNBC, Time, Business Insider, Government Executive, Fortune, The Chronicle of Philanthropy, CNBC, and Inc. Magazine. His, exper his expertise stems from over 20 years of consulting coaching, speaking, and training experience on change management, decision-making, and risk management and risk management strategy. It also comes from his research background as a behavioral science scientist with over 15 years in academia, including seven as a professor at Ohio State University. We'd like to welcome Dr. Gleb Sapersky. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Hector. All right, everyone. So let's talk about how you as cryological professionals can future-proof in the most effective manner using neuroscience-based strategies. Now, what's future-proofing if you haven't heard of this? So future-proofing is making sure that you avoid dangerous threats and avoid missed opportunities. It's where you look at the future and you protect yourself against various problems coming down the road. As we have seen with things from the COVID pandemic, to things like the 2008-2009 fiscal crisis, to many, many projects that I'm sure you did and you've observed that have not gone very well. Future-proofing is really important if you want to make sure to protect yourself, your organization, your career, your projects. And as quality professionals, that's your job, to make sure that quality is there and high quality. And you face a lot of difficulty in doing this by learning about future-proofing tactics using neuroscience, learning about how our brain causes us to steer away from quality. You know, you wouldn't be needed as professionals at all if our brain was predisposed to quality, if our brain was fully rational, which, it would, which if it was, it would steer us toward quality. It isn't. So you need to learn about the ways that our brain goes against quality and how you can protect yourself, your company, your projects, and your organization's funds. So that's what future-proofing will help you do. All right, so the structure of the presentation is that the first part of it, we'll talk about the ways that we go wrong, the ways that our brain goes awry, causes us to make serious mistakes. And the second part of the presentation will give you some tactics and strategies, some tools, some methodologies to address these problems which you can do as quality professionals by yourself or within your quality team or with external stakeholders. You're, you're trying to get production or training others to really focus on quality. So that's gonna be the structure of the presentation. And we're gonna be doing some polling, which is why it's really, really important for you. If you are showing up with Alan's name, I know some people have said I am here. It's super, super helpful for polling. So people we can trick keep attendance and see what various people think of the what's going on here for you to click on that link, go out and go back in. All right, so let's go on without further ado to the strategies that I talked about. First, understanding the quality in decision-making. So it's all going to be about decision-making about the future. So you make the best decisions going forward. Now in decision-making, you've probably been told to be confident, it's really important to be confident, it's valuable to make sure that you are confident in your decisions, you need to trust yourself, you need to be confident in your quality decisions and so on. Now, I'm not gonna start with the professional realm, with quality and confidence in the professional realm, but going to a completely different area, which is driving. So driving is something you need to be confident in, you know, when you're merging on a highway, you don't want to be not confident because you need to speed up, you don't need to slow, you should not, 
be slowing down. Otherwise, it might be pretty dangerous to merge on the highway. Or when you're trying to change lanes, you know, you want, might you want to change lanes with confidence. Of course, looking ahead, being confident, feeling right about yourself, not kind of going in there slowly. It might cause problems if you do that. So you want to be confident in your driving. Now, I'm going to ask you how good you are as a driver. This will be the first poll. Hopefully, we won't get five Ellens as a result of this poll. <laughs> so how good are your driving skills? You're going to see a poll, and you'll be able to answer. How good are your driving skills? Are you in the top half of all drivers, or are you in the bottom half of all drivers? So the top half or the bottom half of all drivers? Please go ahead and vote. Top half or bottom half? See 72% participated. I'll give you five more seconds. All right. So as we see, 91% of you are in the top half and 9% of you are in the bottom half. 91% in the top half. That's interesting, you know. I, of course, by logic, right? It should be 50-50. 50% of you should be in the top half, 50% of you should be in the bottom half of all drivers. But that's not how we think. That's not how we perceive ourselves. And we can see that this is a drastically different result. 91% of you are in the top half and consider yourselves to be in the top half. 9% of you consider yourself to be in the bottom half. Well, probably 41% of you is wrong. So that is a problem. That's a serious issue in the way that we approach our thinking and that we tend to be greatly overconfident about the kind of decisions that we make. This is called the overconfidence bias. So when we're thinking about the future, we tend to be very overconfident about what the future looks like whether it's thinking about quality, whether it's thinking about how a project will go forward, what kind of data is presented, what kind of outcome is going to come as a result of this production, as a result of this training, and how people will react to our proposals for more quality. This is called the overconfidence bias. This is a big problem. When people say they're 100% confident, so bet the company, sort of decision-making, bet the career, they're only right 80% of the time. This is a serious, serious issue. And the more expertise you have and the more authority, the more often you tend to be overconfident, unduly so. There was a study done on doctors and it compared doctors who are senior doctors many, many years over a decade out of medical school and those who just finished medical school and gave them both cohorts this a case study and they had to diagnose the case and recommend a course of treatment. Well, they got the case study evaluation and recommendation of the course of treatment right at about the same rate. But the senior doctors were much, much more confident, <laughs> and, but they weren't more right. Why were they mo more confident? Well, they felt they had a lot of expertise and therefore a lot of authority because of their experience, but they didn't have the fresh knowledge that younger medical school graduates had and they underestimated the quality of this fresh knowledge. So this is a big problem for people with more expertise and more authority. So this is a serious issue. And it's more broadly, it relates to how we think about the future and how we think about our decision-making. We're told to trust our gut, follow our intuitions, go with our heart, be primal, be savage, as Tony Robbins tells you. Now, trusting your gut feels very right. It feels very comfortable. That's intuitive, right? It's our intuitions. It feels right and intuitively correct to trust our gut, but it often leads to decision disasters. This is a serious problem. We don't look at the future accurately when we go with our gut often. So we need to understand that our gut will often lead us in the wrong direction because it's not really evolved for the modern world. It's evolved for the savannah environment. When we had to make very quick decisions in that ancient savannah environment, the fight or flight response was our friend. It guaranteed our... Or in, maximized our likelihood of survival. You might've heard of it as the fighter, as the saber-toothed tiger response. You have to jump at a hundred shadows to get away from that one saber-toothed tiger. Well, we're the descendants of those who had a very good so fight or flight response. The ones who didn't have a very good fight or flight response didn't survive to leave descendants. And so right now we make decisions using the fight or flight response. We look at a very small amount of information and we feel overconfident about it and we act on it. We jump on this information and we go with our gut. So we go with our initial impressions. This is a serious, serious issue. This is a serious problem. 
that you don't want to fall into. So going with your gut causes us to make a lot of problems. And overconfidence is just one of these sort of problems, the overconfidence bias. There's a whole, whole bunch of other cognitive biases. But these are the dangerous judgment errors that we make because of how our brain is wired. So our evolutionary background, the fight or flight response and other problems, for example, tribalism being brought up in that ancient savanna environment, living in small tribes of 50 to 150 people, which is one reason you see this sort of powerful tribalism in our modern environment, despite it really not being conducive to our survival now, to, because we live in a multipolar and global society, and just the structure of the wiring of our brain and the various shortcuts that we tend to take. So these are cognitive biases. There's over 100 of them. And you'll get some resources at the end of this presentation with more information about them. Now, I'm going to ask you another poll. Have you had ever a situation when you felt very confident you were right, but you turned out to be wrong? Is that a situation that you ever experienced? Please go ahead and vote. Okay, yeah, almost everyone participated. I'll give you a few more seconds. Right, so this is something that the large majority of you experienced, 89% of you experienced. So you felt this confidence that you felt very right, but you turned out to be wrong. And this is the typical experience of cognitive biases where you fell into this dangerous judgment error. All right, let's talk about another dangerous judgment error that's really important for you as quality experts. This is called the planning fallacy, the planning fallacy. You've probably heard the phrase, you know, failing to plan is planning to fail, failing to plan is planning to fail. That is unfortunately somewhat misleading. And this is a dangerous way that it's misleading because we tend to assume that when we make a plan, things will go according to plan. That is how it feels. We feel confident about ourselves. We feel that we are good people. We feel that we are good performers. And therefore, when we make a plan, things should fall and go according to plan. This is the way that we think. This is the way that our brain works. Unfortunately, a much better way to think is failing to plan for problems is planning to fail. Failing to plan for problems is planning to fail. In actuality, we see that this assumption that the future will go according to plan leads us to greatly underestimate various risks, various problems, various threats, and the resources required to address these problems. So time resources, money resources, information, social capital. And this has been borne out in a number of issues. So for example, probably a number of you are working in software companies. Well, when you look at large software projects, there was a study done in 2012 which found that large software projects tend to really go over time and budget out of all projects, about 84% of the time, really sizable software projects. Might be that's part of your experience. Then there was another study done on constructions. Maybe some of you are in construction firms, construction projects, large construction projects. That was a 2004 study, tend to go over time and over budget about 86% uh, of the time. So 84% of the time for software, and this is even larger, 86% of the time. So this is a serious issue, especially for more major, major serious projects where you'll have a lot more quality assessments of what's going on. So that's something for us to realize. This planning fallacy is a big, big serious problem for you as quality professionals, as well as the overconfidence bias. Now, how can you assess and evaluate what's going on? Well, before we could do that, uh, I'm gonna ask you about the planning fallacy. Whether there, you think it will be valuable for you and your team to investigate and address any negative impacts from the planning fallacy. Do you think that will be helpful for you? Please go ahead and vote. See about two thirds of you participated, five more seconds.
Great. So yes, yes, the vast majority of you think it will definitely be helpful for you. Great, great to see this. So let's go on to how do you assess for these issues? We're going from the specific examples of cognitive biases to solutions for them. The first solution is, of course, to understand what's going on in your workplace. What is the situation? Knowledge is power, right? You have to know and recognize the problems before you can solve them. The assessment on dangerous judgment errors in the workplace will help you do that. So it focuses on the 30 most dangerous cognitive biases in professional settings, and then it evaluates their extent and impact in your workplace. So that is the, what this assessment on dangerous judgment errors in the workplace is about. So that is the assessment. And then it gives you the next steps for addressing them. Now I'll show you the assessment and a little bit of how it works. You should all be able to see my screen and uh, you should bring up the chat function right now. And we'll be using chat to go through it. So directions, as you can see, each question below refers to a problem that might occur in professional situations. And your goal is just to answer how often it occurred in your workplace in the past year. The answer will be in the terms, percentage terms of how often it might have occurred. You can focus on your workplace and your whole organization, on your specific team, but I encourage you right now to think about your specific team, the one you're most familiar with. And don't really overthink it, just go with your initial impression. I'll ask you to answer your percentage terms in the chat. Now. Good. So number one, and this of course is the planning fallacy, percent of projects that missed the deadline or went over budget in your workplace, whether it's in your business unit, your team, your whole organization is a bit smaller in the past year, what percent of them went over time, uh, went over time or budget? Please go ahead and put your answers into the chat. So 50%, 50, 90%, 20%, 25%. 75, 80, 25, 60, 75, 50, 75, 56. That's very specific. All right. So we see a wide range of answers. Now, if your answer is in the 10 to 20% range, you know, that's what happens. That's understandable, especially with the pandemic disturbing things. And 20 to 30%, it's becoming a little bit more serious. If it's in the 30 to 40% range, it's becoming substantial because then you're really misallocating resources. And if it's over 40%, really, really serious misallocation of resources, poor problematic planning, failing to anticipate those problems and risks. So that is something that you wanna be really thoughtful about. If you're getting over 40, if you're getting over 30%, it's definitely something you want to address. If it's over 40%, absolutely really a priority. And so you want to be bringing this information, thinking about it, bringing it to your leadership. Let's talk about number, let's go about a different one. Number four, in all situations, when someone had evidence that would contradict their beliefs or clear information that would disprove their interpretation of the situation, in what percentage of cases did they ignore the evidence or misinterpret the information? Uh, so Nico asked the question, Nico, can you please save that until the end? I'll be happy to discuss that. So 10%, 70%, 25, 75%, 20%, 5%, 20%, 40%, 10%, 5%, 10%, 40%, 10%, 40%. So we see a little bit lower in this one, but still some substantial numbers. So you want to be thinking about, again, if you are in the you know, 5 to 10% range, you know, up to 20%, that's pretty good. If you're getting beyond 20%, that's something you want to be thinking about. As really, if you want to, if you're at 40% and above, that's a really, really high priority. So this is something for you to realize. This is called the confirmation bias, where we tend to look for information that confirms our beliefs and ignore information that doesn't. So this is another serious type of cognitive bias. And there are over 30 of these cognitive biases described in this assessment. So the assessment goes through them and it helps you learn about each of these cognitive biases. 
and using these specific types of scenarios. You don't need to learn anything about confirmation bias or planning fallacy or overconfidence bias. You don't need to know about them if you're taking it. Just look at behavior. So it's about behavior-based assessment. So you can go back to your team, present it to them, and have them take it and then have a discussion of it. And that's how a really good way of introducing this information to folks. And I'm going to ask you about that. Do you think it would be helpful for you to, for you and your team to take the assessment and address the cognitive biases it uncovers? Would it be low value, moderate value, or high value? Please go ahead. Go ahead and vote. Give you five more seconds to vote, to make your voice heard. <clears throat> All right, so we see that over a third of you would find it high value. Great, over half would find it moderate value and uh, under 10% would find it for low value. So it's low value, obviously don't worry about it. The moderate value, you'll want to get a copy of it and I'll give you a way to get it at the end. If you're not Alan Barrow, which you know we can't have your email if you did not sign in appropriately. And uh, so if it's moderate value, you should take it yourself and see how valuable it is. And then you should decide whether you want to bring it to the, your teammates. If it's high value, then you definitely want to right away as after you get it to forward it to your team and have a discussion about having a team activity of taking it and addressing it, the cognitive biases it uncovers. Now, let me go back to briefly answer Nico's question. So he asked, before dismissing gut instinct, do we understand where it comes from? Absolutely. So I think I talked about in the beginning where it comes from that evolutionary background where we have that strong fight or flight response, where we have a strong tribalism and we have a lot of other strong reactions. So that gut instinct comes from that tribal response, that fight or flight response, those base instincts. And that's what we want to address, these cognitive biases. That's separate from your expert knowledge. So when you have expert knowledge on a topic, not a domain, but a specific topic, Let's say it has to be something when you have expert knowledge and you can take a quick glance at it and you can quickly assess what's wrong. Expert knowledge is comes from a specific practice where there's a specific domain, like let's say profit and law statements or your QMS. So if you have a QMS, hopefully you do, you know, some people I know use various Excel spreadsheets, but if you have a QMS, your and you've been using it a lot, you can probably take a quick glance at it and you can see, okay, you know what's going on in the system through experiencing it a lot and getting quick feedback on whether your evaluation is correct or not. So expert intuition in various domains comes from having a lot of experience in a specific limited narrow domain and having a lot of quick feedback about whether you're right or whether you're wrong. An everyday example is email. You probably can take a very quick glance at your email and see whether something is spam or whether something is useful and you'll be right you know, 95% of the time. That's because you have a lot of practice and feedback and looking at your email. So that's the only type of quick decision-making process in professional settings that I endorse. This expert intuition and that, I mean, I endorse because the research endorses it. This, uh, it's, you, you might've heard of it expressed as expert intuition, expert knowledge, a lot of various terms, but that's very narrow domains. You know, if you have a profit and loss responsibility, you can take a look at a PNL statement and quickly evaluate that. So otherwise you really can't trust your quick judgments. Our quick judgments are going to lead us wrong in very, very many situations. So you always wanna check with your head before going with your gut. Again, our gut will sometimes be right. It will sometimes be wrong. You just simply can't trust it. You always want to check with your head before going with your gut. Now, let's talk about a technique you can use to make quick and effective decisions, whether it's for you, whether it's for your team, 
you can, whether it's a team making it together, you can use this technique to make good enough decisions on any questions where you just don't want to screw up, you want to make sure it's a good enough decision. It doesn't guarantee maximize the most perfect ideal answer, but it will make it much more likely that you aren't wrong, that you aren't making a mistake. So first question contains five questions that you want to ask yourself about any decision you don't want to screw up. Five questions. First question, what important information didn't I yet fully consider? So what evidence didn't I take into account is the question. And you want to look especially for information that this confirms your beliefs. So we talked about the confirmation biases. We tend to look for information that confirms our beliefs and ignore information that doesn't. In order to fight that, that first question really asks you to look for information that you don't fully consider because it doesn't align with your beliefs. So you want to look for information that goes against your beliefs, that goes against your intuitions, where you can prove yourself wrong. That's very important. Second, what dangerous judgment errors didn't I yet fully address? So in any sort of question, once you go for the assessment and learn about these dangerous judgment errors and the book that I'll also send you, you'll be able to quickly bring them to mind. Oh, planning fallacy might be an issue, overconfidence bias, optimism bias, illusion of transparency, confirmation bias. And you can bring, quickly bring them to mind and address them. Third, what would a trusted and objective advisor suggest I do? So think about that angel on your shoulder. What would they suggest you do in the situation? You can get about 50% of the benefit from this question just by asking it out loud and asking yourself this question. What would you do? What would you tell a trusted friend to do in this situation? And of course, you can get the other 50% of the benefit by actually getting this external perspective. Fourth, how have I addressed all the ways this could fail? And you probably are somewhat familiar with asking this question in quality, but you want to make sure to ask this question effectively. How have you addressed all the ways this could fail in advance? And finally, what new information would cause me to revisit this decision? We tend to not like to change our minds. We tend to become stuck to our decisions. And this is a serious problem because you need to really be thinking, how can you revisit the decision in order to see whether something would cause you to change your mind and what would cause you to change your mind. And so you want to decide in advance the kind of things that would cause you to change your mind because it makes it much easier for you to not be stuck to your initial decision. Now, I'm gonna ask again for a poll and I'm curious whether you think it will be, this will be valuable for you and your team to use for any good enough decisions you don't want to get wrong. Would this be a helpful process? It's about two thirds participated. Let's give you five more seconds. Great, so this seems close to, but somewhat more popular than the assessment. So again, this uh, nobody thinks will be of a low value. It's either moderate value or high value. So again, for high value, you want to immediately send this information to your team and suggest that you use it for moderate value. You want to experiment with it to yourself and decide whether you want to send it to your team. All right, and the last technique that I'll be talking about is more about how to look at your strategy. So we talked about, this is all about how to prevent failure for your strategic approaches to the future. So this is failure proofing. We talked about future proofing. This really focuses, technique focuses on addressing failure potential in your projects. So how do you address that? So it has a number of steps, which I'll go through in order, eight steps for gathering relevant stakeholders, explaining the process, developing an NBA, next best alternative, brainstorming reasons for failure, deciding on the most likely problems, brainstorming, fixing them, doing the same for success, and then revising the plan. All right, so first you want to gather stakeholders who are relevant to the situation. That's six to 10 people. You really don't want to go more than that because it'll be too crowded and it'll be hard for everyone to get a chance to participate. You want a combination of leaders with the most expertise and people who are not just the highest up, 
but people in leadership positions who have expertise, even if they're in lower positions. And sometimes they might not be leaders, they might be rank and file staff who have specific expertise on a question. So include power with the people with the power to make and implement decisions so that they have buy-in, of course, and strongly consider using an independent facilitator from outside the team so that the all the team can fully participate in the discussion. That's one. Next, explain the process. You want to explain what the process will look like, explain this technique, describing all the steps, everyone's on the same page. Next, develop next best alternative. You want two next best alternatives developed as a result of this. And how you do that is you want to have each participant write down one next best alternative. So next best alternative to your original plan. You're coming into this with a plan for a project or a process. So again, this is for projects or processes and you want to have a certain plan, a certain approach to it. And the NBA is where you come up with a different way of doing it than you originally anticipated. So have each participant write down an NBA, one NBA anonymously. Anonymity is really important here because you don't want people to feel like, well, you know, I don't want to criticize the project and therefore I'm not going to write an NBA. You want people to seriously think about it and write an NBA. And so this is really valuable. The facilitator gathers and reads everyone's next best alternative. And then you hold the vote. You have a discussion and you hold a vote to select the top two. So a discussion and then a vote. And then you take have that anonymous vote on which one of them is preferable. This is really important to have an anonymous vote. Then, so you got the NBA. You got which one is preferable. Maybe one of them will be preferable to your original plan. And even if not, you can think about including parts of it in your original plan. All right, so now we have the NBA and we have a potentially modified original plan for a process or a project for major one. Then you want to brainstorm reasons for failure. Why might this go wrong? Why might this fail? Imagine, and you don't want to say, why might it fail? That's not the right question to be asking at this stage because people will often, who are attached to it, will often not want to even permit themselves to think that it might fail. Instead, you want to say, imagine this decision, this project, this process, it absolutely definitively failed, totally failed, no question about it. Why did it fail? You want to brainstorm reasons for why it failed, assuming that it failed. This is an assumption. So you assume that it failed, you, know, you launch a product and six months later, it's terrible. You try to have a major software projects and you know, in, you implement it and nobody's using it because it's atrocious. Why did it fail? So these are the kinds of things. You want to assume that it failed and brainstorm reasons. Each participant should write down at least three plausible reasons for failure anonymously for the same reasons as anonymity before. And the facilitator gathers everyone's statements, highlights key themes and focuses on reasons that wouldn't be typically brought up while ensuring anonymity. And of course, not typically brought up are things that might be politically sensitive, you know, maybe criticizing the project leader's competence or something like that, or talking about conflicts in the team. Very useful technique. And then you want to decide on which of these problems are most likely. Once you have a thorough list, discuss these possible reasons, and especially those that seem problematic to discuss, politically issue challenging, Check for potential cognitive biases, which you know you have the assessment, you know what that's about. Assess anonymously the likelihood of each reason for failure. So have a vote, so have a score anonymously for each problem using percentages. Pay special attention to the ones that are most harmful, most probable combination of most probable and most impactful. And then brainstorm how to fix problems. So how do you fix each of the problems, especially the ones that seem most impactful and likely? So decide on several failures that are most relevant, brainstorm ways of solving them, and address potential mental blind spots, these cognitive biases, using the assessment idea. Next, you want to do the same thing for success. Avoid failure proofing is not only about preventing failure, but ensuring success. So one way to fail is to succeed less well than you would have otherwise. So you want to brainstorm ways. You want, so you're doing the same process for failure, but the, instead, imagine that it succeeded. It's wonderful. It succeeded beyond your wildest expectations. Brainstorm ways of achieving this outcome. Again, anonymously, three plausible reasons for success, 
The facilitator gathers everyone's statements, highlights key themes, leads discussion, checking for cognitive biases, and brainstorm ways of maximizing each reason for success. And finally, the last step, revise the plan. Revise the overall plan based on the strategic exercise, and if needed, the exercise is repeated if you have significant revisions. So that's the failure proofing technique. And I'm gonna ask you the same thing that I asked in the poll, if you think this might be helpful for you. So go ahead, vote on whether this might be helpful for major projects where you want to ensure high quality. Okay, five more seconds. I see that three quarters of you participated. All right, and we see that this technique is the most popular so far. So over half of you would see it high value. So again, this is something to immediately bring to your uh, team and share with them and moderate value you want to experiment with, your, with yourself, see how valuable it is, and then decide on what to do. Great, so talk about key takeaways from this presentation. Normalcy bias, planning fallacy over confidence bias undermine our future proofing abilities. And these are variety of cognitive biases. Five questions to avoid decision disasters helps us future proof on daily decision-making, the ones you don't want to screw up. And failure proofing is a practice debiasing technique that helps us future proof projects, decisions, and plans, major ones. So that's the takeaways I want you to be thinking about. And I, I promise there will be free additional resources for you to get the assessment and dangerous judgment errors, the decision aid and five key questions, manual on defending your future, and sample chapters for my best selling book, Never Go With Your Gut How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters. Now happy to do a coaching session for the first three claimants who want to integrate this information into their activities. And we'll do the poll. And this would be definitely, I hope that you have had a chance to put, uh, to get in and out if you had Alan's name. If you didn't, and you still have Alan's name, please put your name and email into the chat and I'll see if I can send it to you individually that way. So that would be a technique, but otherwise, Please go ahead and vote. But while they're voting, all the Allens have been corrected. Great, I'm glad to hear it. Thank you, Alan. The real one. Yes, the real one. <laughs> Good. All right. So, and while the poll is ongoing, I'll be happy to answer questions. I saw that somebody chatted, put an answer into the chat, put some questions into the chat. So Stephen asks, do you take into account in decision-making imperfect data? Of course, this is fundamentally important to take into account imperfect data. So imperfect data is part, and there's actually a cognitive bias related to this called the information bias, where we tend to look for too much information we're beyond what we need to make the decision. So first we need to think about how much information we need to make a decision. And sometimes we have enough data, even if you know some additional data would be nice. So you don't wanna get into analysis paralysis. That's one uh, dynamic. Second, imperfect data is a dynamic of any situation. And you want to be thinking about that. What important information didn't I yet fully consider, for example. And one of the things you wanna be considering is, well, this data, might be somewhat imperfect. So what are the what's the probability that I'm right? What's the probability that I'm wrong? And how do I evaluate these probabilities? So that is definitely something to be considering about. What about risk-averse companies versus risk-seeking ones? This has to be a decision for a company and a deliberate decision. You can be a risk-seeking company and say, okay, well, I'm going to be going out and looking for these risks and it's not a problem as long as you don't run into, let's say, overconfidence. So you might be thinking that, well, I'm okay with the risk of 20% failure on this because the upside is so good. 
but if you're overconfident, you might actually take on a risk of you know, 60% failure when you think it's 20%. So you don't want to do that. And of course, the opposite can be true for risk-averse companies. A risk-averse company can say, well, we're comfortable with only a chance of 5% failure. But if they're overconfident about the failure, they can say, well, this has a 10% chance failure. But in reality, this might have only a 2% chance failure. So overconfidence and various other cognitive biases go on in all sorts of companies. So, uh, and Nico, that's kind of a common, not a question. So I was, yeah, I'm not gonna uh, address that. So please go ahead and any additional comments would be welcomed. Comment, I'm sorry, any additional questions would be welcomed. Put them into the chat. You can unmute yourself. We have a pretty small group here, so it shouldn't be too chaotic. Happy to answer questions. I'll be closing up the poll in like 10 seconds. So if you didn't vote yet, please do. I'm not seeing questions. If I don't see it, I'm not seeing questions. If I don't see or hear a question in five seconds, I'll presume that everything is super clear and you're all ready to go. All right, great. So it seems everything is all clear. Everything is good. I'm glad that we clarified the elements. That'll be helpful for the polling and that'll be helpful obviously for the getting credit great everyone well i hope you've enjoyed the session thank you very very much we really appreciate it glad that was a tremendous presentation definitely some welcome. food for thought we we welcome it i'm sure if uh, hector's on there he will uh might have a few words for you as well as far as a thank you and uh i'm sure he'll be sending you a little uh little uh item of appreciation from us we normally send to somebody and we always appreciate you being here and uh very very well there you're getting a lot of comments here on up there you're getting a lot of nice comments on your presentation yeah. thank you all we we really appreciate it uh, hector anything you'd like to add uh no just uh, again thank you very much you got a lot of a lot of great information and um uh some of the tools i mean obviously uh you know, your, the, the failure proofing technique uh, does follow uh, you know, how we relate it to quality as a uh, problem solving methodology. So a lot of the, uh, uh, you, you follow those steps. And then also uh, at the end is the, you, you can see the, uh, the plan to check act uh, methodology also used. So there's a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of the tools that we're familiar with and, and it's great to see that you're incorporating them in, uh, uh, in the type of work that you're doing. So thank you very much. Um, for, for your presentation. It's truly appreciated and uh, very uh, educational and insightful. Thank you. You're very welcome. All right. Well, I hope you have a good rest of your day, everyone, or rest of your evening, of course. All right, everyone. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank, thank you, everyone. We appreciate it. And we'll see you uh, next, uh, well, for the uh, November meeting, everyone. Yeah, that'll be on, that's going to be on Thursday, November 4th. Uh, it is on a Thursday, November 4th. Uh, and the uh, topic is root cause investigation for CAPRA. Okay. Thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic. Thanks, everyone. Have a good Thanks. evening. Bye. Bye. Thank you.